Emed Mostak. He's the founder and CEO of Stability.ai. Welcome to you. We're also joined by Dear Jabosa and Steve Kovac. And wait, Dear, that, that does not... Okay, in fairness, Emad, wow. we didn't have a, you know... A, a oh, my goodness. These are the AI-generated images. Is this an improvement? <laughs> um, they missed a few things, I think. <laughs> I'm yeah. Stephen Deirdre using the technology. So, Emad, why don't you run us through what's going on behind the scenes here? So, yeah, so we released um, Stable Diffusion and Image Generation AI open source last August, where we took two billion images, a snapshot of the internet, and squished it down into a two-gigabyte file. That drove a lot of these avatar apps you see in text-to-image generation. I think it was four of the top 10 App Store apps on the App Store in December. But these data sets aren't good enough. And these models aren't good enough because of the data. You want to have your own CNBC model. You want to have your own Portuguese model and other totally. things. And this is a big part of this debate that's happened right now. Because the data sets of these models are black boxes. So we don't know what's inside them. So we wanted to push this stuff into the open for safety and also for customizability. We all have about a trillion questions we're going to try to get through. <laughs> so my, my first and then I'll turn it over is... Uh, because to me, the most obvious question here is copyright. We're already seeing major organizations, you know, I can think of a Getty Images, for instance, mm. saying, wait a minute, our pixels are involved in the recreation of these. Um, how are you trying to get ahead of that? And, and can you kind of address the business model and whatever it is in, in that response as well? Yes, yeah, so I think this is a really fascinating thing, because if you take two billion images, 100,000 gigabytes, you get a two gigabytes output. What is that? Is that fair use? Is it not? We have Mark Lemley from Stanford. He has an amazing piece on that on fair use, and he wrote the book on it. And so that's leading kind of our legal side. This is, these are questions we have to answer. So one of the things we did is we opted opt out, unlike everyone else. So we had 169 million images opted out of our data set Interesting. for the next version. Because I think that's the reasonable thing to do and the right thing to do. Whereas a lot of other companies are just training on whatever, and you don't know what's going inside, and then you don't know what's going out of it which is why the models are turning a bit weirder and a bit crazier. Yes, a lot of them, and dear job, I'm going to bring you in here, but a lot of them start out when people use them the first couple of times to go, wow, this is yeah. amazing, and then all of a sudden they start to lose some of their edge. Go ahead, Deirdre. Yeah, so I think this whole discussion between an open and closed uh, source model is really interesting, Ahmed. Uh, some of the questions around that, though, is how stable are some of the open source models? And to that point, there's the back-end development. How many AI researchers or engineers does Stability AI actually employ, and how many are contracted? Oh, yeah, so we've got about 78 full-time AI engineers doing language, image, audio, everything. So we do all the different modalities. And then we have a separate collaboration with about 200 university researchers and others. So I think we're the fourth largest provider of compute to U.S. academia okay. right now. And we split so into you've two. got the majority yeah. is outside of the actual organization. So how do businesses, how can they be confident that your model is reliable and it's not going to change based on the turnover or the whims of an engineering force that you don't necessarily employ or control? So what we do is our team builds the stable series of models. Um, and so that's what's going into Amazon's new bedrock service and things, where everything is measured. It's only built by our team. And then the other 200 are just stimulating academic innovation because oh. there wasn't enough compute for academic innovation, but those are not commercial models. So we split okay. it into and two, the open core model, as it were. Maybe a last one for me. Um, I know there's also, based on that too, some of the clarity around who's with the organization, who isn't. There's been a lack of clarity, claims of a lack of clarity on Stability AI's IP, and I wonder if you can clear those up. Yeah, and that's why we kind of, originally we were like, let's all collaborate together. And then it was like, this is getting confusing. So we said, stability models, the stable series, 100% stability. And then the other stuff we kind of fund. And then, like I said, you want to have full auditability. You want to know every single thing. And all the IP is completely secure. Because open models are required for private data. They're required for regulated data and other things like that as well. And so we want to make that very clear. And this is part of learning as an organization as you grow. Before I bring in Steve, so I guess I would say, are you a business right now? I mean, is there revenue? Are there going to be earnings? Or is this just an academic exercise? Oh, no, we're a business. We've got eight-digit revenue, you know, and that's where up rapidly. Coming from where? Who's pay it comes from the API at the moment. But uh, as one example, we announced the Amazon Bedrock service, where you can take our open models of revenue modality to your data center in your cloud, and you can fine-tune and train it. And then we have an agreement with Amazon whereby we participate in the upside for that. So when you say you want to remain open source, what would your response be? I, I'm sort of confused somewhat as to the difference between being a profitable business, which Musk seems unhappy about, and being open source, which isn't necessarily in conflict with that. Can you just address that? I think OpenAI came at a time when it was very difficult to have these models. The models weren't good enough right, as a business model. Right now, though, you're looking and you're seeing CNBC, for example. You can't send all your internal data to OpenAI or Microsoft. But inside your Amazon cloud or other clouds, you'll be able to use our language models because you'll own them. Yep. And that's a valuable thing. 
So OpenAI is no longer open source in terms of they will not open source their models, and Ilya Sutskivar and other people have said that they don't believe in that anymore. They open source other models. Um, whereas we're open source by default because we think open mm. is required for auditable models, that's required for private data, IP rich data, and there's a business model that's amazing for that. All right, Steve, I, I'm struggling to keep up here. J go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. So, Ahmad, I was curious, I was on Capitol Hill yesterday listening to Sam Altman's testimony. And, you know, one of the things that came up was not necessarily open source, but transparency, meaning, mm. you know, the, the idea that you would disclose uh, how you're training your models and, and so forth. We know OpenAI and Microsoft keep that uh, locked down, as does Google. And there's a lot of talk. How are these models being trained? So while you're saying you're open source, are you also being open and transparent about how your models are trained and what data sets are you using? Because that seems to be a big key for how regulators are thinking about AI. 100%. We make our data sets open, our models open. And next week, we're actually moving to open training. So we're going to show live how these models are training in image and language and others, because we think that transparency is required. Like I said, especially if you're talking about regulated industry and other things. These models will be the biggest impact in healthcare, education, and others. And how can you have black boxes on that? How can governments run on black boxes? So does that mean OpenAI and Google, are they making a mistake by keeping their data sets kind of locked down and secret? No, I think you'll have both. I think you'll have hybrid AI. So you're going to use some things for closed that are amazing, because it will always be better than open, because you can bring proprietary data to it. And other people will want open, auditable models for their private data. So you have the stuff in the cloud and then the stuff that you use outside the cloud. You know, this all may seem a little esoteric, but if you guys, I mean, if, if video is next, can you just, we, you know, I think, do we have the gardening images? If anyone wants to know, deep fakes, okay, in the political, th this came up on Capitol Hill yesterday, mm. this idea of how will we know if something is an AI generated image versus not, not in the creative realm where people, we already have artists who can do yeah. that. But is it a representation of a fact that doesn't exist, i.e. me having, you know, any capability or, or any green thumb? Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's not gardening. <laughs> but that, <laughs> yeah. Is that and, you, Kelly? And it, I, that's me. Are you supposed uh, to be? Is, is video next? Yeah, video is coming. Audio now, you've seen the thing with Grimes and others. You've got perfect audio, video, images, they're all coming. In the next few years, you'll be able to generate Hollywood-level movies live. And this is why we need standards around it. So we set up stability and we work with multiple governments on national data sets to replace crawl data sets. National models, national standards. So in all our models, we have invisible watermarking, we have attribution coming in. Because so we think the open side can be a million different types or you can standardize it. And so that's what we're doing as our business model. It's a completely different total addressable market to the Googles and open AIs of the world. And it's only possible now. So quick last question again. We, could, we hope to continue this many a time. Um, after the hearing yesterday, what do you think is the direction that policy is going to go? I think the policy will move towards some sort of regulated entity, but it's a case of how do you balance innovation and regulation? Because on the one hand, this will transform entire industries and lead to massive productivity increases. So 50% of all code on GitHub is AI generated now, wow. and code is a 40% more efficient. But then there are some real risks, which is why I signed the FLI letter with Elon Musk and others, where we have a six-month window now to have better data sets and better practices to curb some of these really dangerous things that could happen. Yeah, no, as we're showing uh, more, more AI generated, they are pretty good. They've gotten spooky, <laughs> spookily good. Creation is fun. Yes, it is fun, uh, terrifying. Imad, thank you so much for your time today. It's really great to have you here. Steve and Deirdre, My thank friend. you for now. Our Steve Kovac, the real ones. Deirdre Bosa. Yeah, the actual people for, for the time being. Give it six months. Speaking of AI, ServiceNow and NVIDIA are announcing a new partnership to build generative AI across enterprise IT. Both of those CEOs will be on Closing Bell Overtime today at 4 p.m. Eastern time. You definitely don't want to miss it.